Jesus is one. Talk about a child that do love Jesus is one. Ever since I heard the gospel story, I've been walking up the path to glory. Talk about a child that do love Jesus is one. Talk about a child that's been converted is one. Talk about a child that's been in my spirit this morning. Thank you. Amen. Now it's in our The men that um, I'm surrounded with and that I can pray for and pray for me and uh, when I take a break I know that they've studied I know that God's word is in their heart and they have something to share and so Pastor Dave's going to come, Minister Dave, Dave whatever I'm calling um, <laughs> He has a word to share with us this morning, and so we eagerly sit and await that. Father, our hearts are open. We want to hear what your servant has to say. Thank you for his preparation. Thank you for his household that helps him easy to do your work. We love you and give you glory, and we're listening in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Here's Dave! Dave's not home. Let me get the microphone on. My wife says I don't really need a microphone, but uh, I'm going to use it anyway, okay? <laughs> I take that as a compliment. I've got a loud. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear you? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay, we're on. So you can call me whatever you want. Just don't ever call me late for dinner. You can tell I like to eat. I love to eat. My wife will vouch for that. Okay, let's pray. I always like to start. I do like to tell stories. I guess let's mm -hmm. let's uh, <laughs> settle things right now. I like to tell stories. People that have been around me know that. But what I like to do most of all or like what I want you to remember is God's story, yes. the story of Amen. Jesus. Amen. And I do share my testimony when I preach. I'll be sharing some of my past life. And it's not to bring that any glory at all. It's just to show people where I came from. So I was a big well, knucklehead well, out there. Well, and well, God well, transformed me by the renewing of my mind. I'm on fire for the Lord just as much today as the day I got saved. 
Yes. And uh, I always like to start out with prayer, and I want you to know that I share my testimony only so you know where I came from and where I'm at today. So just remember God's story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. We've had, we, we all had a thousand different choices of where we could go, what we could do. We chose to be in here in your presence. Not that we're not in your presence when we're outside of the walls of this church. But there's something about gathering together and having fellowship with other Christians who we're evenly yoked with. We get a blessing out of it. Praising you together. Worshiping you. Singing for you. Praying to you. And reading your scripture together. And talking about it. That's beneficial for our lives, our spiritual person, and we need to feed our spirit just like we feed our physical. Amen. So bless us today, as you've already done. We love you, we praise you, and you get the glory for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All God's people said, Amen. 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 Okay, so uh, one of the things, there's several things, you know, when we get up here as a, as a preacher, we want to make sure we don't say the wrong things, and there's always so much stuff I could get up here and say, and I want to say, but one of the things God put on my heart this morning, it has nothing to do with the scripture we're going to preach on, is Psalm 34a, which says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I hope Amen. you're tasting and you're seeing that the Lord is good, because Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. Amen. Amen. So we're going to come out of 2 Corinthians, and there's only one verse I want to talk about. There's a lot of stuff in that one little verse. 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's talking about the ministry of reconciliation. Right. And the Apostle Paul had actually, it's, you know, I got this little cheater book, the Bible, and it says who the author is and when about it was written and, um, you know, why it was written. And it says in this Bible I have, it's, a, it's like a study Bible, and it says that Paul actually wrote like four letters to the church of Corinth. And the third one was like a severe letter. And then... I think he softened up and he found out because they weren't serving the Lord. They weren't living for the Lord. They were going to church and just doing their own thing. And I've been guilty of that. Amen. You know, Amen. I've done things I'm ashamed of. I'm sure everybody in here has done things they wish they could do over. And maybe not have done that. I think we're all guilty of that, but maybe one person that walked this earth named Jesus and none of us are Jesus. Amen. We want to be Christ-like, but we never become Christ. So we're going to have problems. We're going to make mistakes. But... Um, he softened up and he wrote the second, uh, the second letter or whatever, 2 Corinthians. So we're coming out of chapter 5, verse 17. But I want to read 11 through 21 out of the Bible. I usually like to do my flashcard. But, you know, the Lord put this on my heart this morning. Just read the whole thing so you guys are more familiar with it. And then we're going to focus on one verse out of those 11 verses. So we're going to read... 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 21, and then we're going to, I got a little cheat card here, we're going to focus on one verse out of those, and it's titled, The Ministry of Reconciliation. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. Verse 13. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Amen. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that, love, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The Amen. old is gone. Yes. The new has come. Amen. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, 
not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And verse 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now we've got to remember that this was written to the church in Corinth. He's writing this to Christians. People that are so-called Christians, why do they even need to hear this? Well, there's a lot of people that go to church and they think they're Christians. They think they're going to, you know, I was one of those guys. I thought I was going to, my parents are Christians. I must be a Christian. I'm going up to church. So I'm going to ride their coattail on in. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and uh, I was living in the world as soon as I left church. Not that I was really living for the Lord while I was in church for a couple hours. You know, but I just knew I was supposed to be in church because I was raised in church. And uh, so I went to church. And I was not saved at all. But I'm going to share part of that in my testimony. One of the things uh, that the Bible also said in this is Paul wrote this from Macedonia in like AD 55. And it was to the church in Corinth. And Corinth was a thriving city. It was like the chief city in Greece at the time. None of us were there. So, you know, that was a while ago, 55 AD. And uh, it was... The greatest city, it says, both commercially and politically. So it was a big city, and it was thriving. And so there was a lot of things going on. You ever been into a big city like L.A. or San Francisco or even Sacramento? It's like a zoo sometimes. It's just crazy. There's all kinds of crazy people there, and I'm sure that's how it was in Corinth. So he writes this, and my title this morning, he wrote this one verse that really stuck out. And one of the reasons I chose it also is I work for Team Challenge. And we have a motto of scripture that we stand on, and it's this scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So my question this morning is, got Christ? Amen. You've, you've seen that commercial, got milk? Well, my question is, got Christ? And if we have Christ, there's something about having Christ. We get There's a bumper sticker that also says, if you have no... N-O Jesus, you N-O peace. But if you K-N-O-W Jesus, you K-N-O-W peace. No Jesus, no peace. If you don't know Jesus, you have no peace. But if you do know Jesus, you do have peace. Okay, so I was raised in church from the time I was sharing with Brenda. We were in uh, the church I was raised in last Sunday. And I, I started attending that church when I was 10 months old. I don't remember anything about it when I was 10 months old, but I remember learning um, John 3.16 when I was in the third grade. And I got on stage, and I had it written out on this piece of, it looked like a big old piece of binder paper, but it was on a roll. So I stood behind it, and I held it up like this, and I quoted the whole scripture. And I got my first leather-bound King James Version Bible when I was in third grade at the church I was raised in. So I learned that I was supposed to be in church. I learned most of my values and morals by the time I was five. Knew right from wrong. And you know, um, some things happened and I ventured off. I started trying cigarettes when I was nine. I started trying alcohol when I was 11. I started trying marijuana when I was 15. And I, I realized I couldn't, I couldn't um, support my marijuana habit on my lunch money I was getting. So I decided to start selling drugs. And I was only 15 years old. My parents had no idea I was doing this. I don't know what they knew. I don't know how much they knew, how much they didn't know. And uh, it just got progressively worse when I was 17. I, get, I became a full-blown alcoholic. And I drank alcohol every day for about 15 years. Wow. And, uh, and I started trying cocaine, and I started trying methamphetamine, and I started trying Valium. I just became a garbage can, whatever I could alter my mood and mind with. That was good for me because I didn't, you know, I was ashamed of myself and uh, there was a lot of things. And it, it became a lifestyle. I just learned this lifestyle. I didn't get taught from my parents. So uh, I'd lost everything, my ex-wife and the Lord. And it's like, I can't do another step. It's just beating us into the ground. When I asked Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior, 
It's like a 10,000 pound weight just lifted off my shoulders. I felt like I had a little pep in my step, got a smile on my face. I was by myself in the Lord. It was just, you know, I guess the four of us, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and me. And all of a sudden, I went from weeping and crying and disappointed in myself to full of joy. This peace just came upon me that we sang about. This wonderful peace. And uh, you can't explain it to people that haven't experienced it, but people that have experienced it, they get it. And I said, Jesus, I got you in my heart. I want my family back, but even if I don't get them back, it's going to be okay because I got you. And uh, what a great experience that was. And I served the Lord three and a half years faithfully. And then my ex-wife and I separated. We, we, we got back together, tried to make things work. We separated again, and I relapsed for nine years. And then it was getting worse and worse. I ended up becoming homeless. I was living in my car. And uh, my parents, my mom, was feeding me on the front porch of their house. Wouldn't let me in. Nobody would open their door. I'd walk out. They'd look out. What do you want? We don't want you here. Go on. None of my family would open the door because I was that bad on meth. And I was, uh, like I said, I was homeless. And on May 24, 2006, my life just spun out of control again. And I was tired. I was done living for the world. And I entered this crazy place called Teen Challenge. I didn't go through the Sacramento Valley Teen Challenge. I went to Shafter, California by Bakersfield. From there, I spent three months. The moment I walked through the doors, I said, God, I'm tired of running from you. I know you got a calling on my life. Come back into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I believe you went to the cross. You died on that cross for my sins. I know you have the power to forgive me. Please forgive me of my sins. And I want to serve you. I reinvited Jesus back into my heart. I'd spent three months in Shafter. I went to Riverside. I spent a year there. I went to TCMI, which stands for Teen Challenge Ministry Institute. It's a Bible college. And uh, I, I, I spent a year there. Then I graduated there. Then I got hired by the Sacramento Valley Teen Challenge. And it's been a great journey. I uh, married my beautiful wife, Miranda, um, February 23rd. <laughs> I better not forget that. <laughs> February 23rd this year. And so we're coming up on our eight month anniversary. Well, her birthday's close by. It's February 26th. And, um, and, and it's such a great experience to be uh, seeing all these blessings from the Lord. And I didn't enter this relationship anticipating blessings coming my way. They just do. When we serve the Lord and we're busy about His business, He's busy about our business. Amen. And so she never thought she was going to meet a husband. And her mom kept telling her, you're going to meet somebody. She works in the, at the thrift store in the back room sorting clothes, and she never even sees the public. I mean, she's tucked back there. And one of my friends told me about Randa, and uh, he goes, if I was you, Dave, I'd be trying to uh, date this lady and hook up with her. Hook up with her, yeah. We can handle that. So I went by the I, I started chatting with her. One thing led to another, and we ended up falling in love and getting married. And the, the thing is, we both love Jesus. Amen. And it's so much easier to love others when we have the love of Jesus in us. Yeah. And so the journey just keeps getting better and better and better. So my, my testimony changes <laughs> as we go. But it just gets better and better and better. So that's a little brief history on you know, my testimony in a nutshell. But now I'm getting to God Christ. If you notice... It says, therefore, if anyone, you know what that means? All are welcome. That's right. Did you know that? That's right. Remember how that sign said, welcome, all are welcome? Right. Pastor Brown didn't see my notes, I promise. We didn't even talk about this. Right. All are welcome. God's reaching his hand down for all of us. Saying, I'm waiting for you. Just grab up and I'll pull you out of that pit if you're in one. Yeah. I was in a deep pit. And I finally swallowed my pride. I said, man, I need some help. So I grabbed on to Jesus' hand. He pulled me up out of that slimy pit. So, therefore, if anyone, that means we're all welcome. Everybody is welcome. There's no reason why we shouldn't ask Jesus into our hearts, our Lord and Savior. I was given many opportunities, and I just pushed Jesus away. I just rejected Jesus. Kept rejecting Jesus. 
You know, we just keep rejecting Jesus and we get further and further separated. This world corrupts us. This world doesn't help us draw closer to Jesus. Other Christians help us. we got to get into church. It's important. Yes. And uh, God wants us all to be up into heaven. You remember what the scripture says? It says that he doesn't want anyone to perish, but that everyone should come to repentance and be saved. The thing is, I've heard pastors say this. God's a perfect gentleman. So he's not going to force us to serve him. He didn't make a bunch of robots where we have to serve him. He gives us free will. Yeah. It's a choice. And Randy and I were just talking about this this morning. It's heartbreaking. Because I got a son. He's on meth just like I was. And it breaks my heart when I see him. He's out of his mind. There's nothing I can do but pray. My parents prayed for me for 30 and a half years. They set a good example. And when I see my son, I don't even want to be around him. But I keep praying for him, and I believe one day yes. he's going to reach back. Grab a hold of Jesus. Yep. <laughs> and he's going to get out of that pit. But it's not my choice. The thing is, some of us, our choices, if we reject Jesus till the day we go to our grave, it's over. We've lost the battle, we've lost the fight, and we don't win. So if we ask Jesus into our heart as our Lord and Savior and our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, then when we leave this earth, we win. So, if anyone is in Christ, we're all invited, all are welcome. That's point number one. Point number two, does Christ have your heart? Because if we're in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, that means we've asked Jesus into our heart as our Lord and Savior. We have Jesus in our heart. That means He has all of our heart. Yes, yes. And we're going to do what He tells us to do through His Word. His Word says, if you love me, in John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So the question is, you don't have to ask me, Dave, do you think I love Jesus? We all have to ask ourselves, do I really love you, Jesus? How do we know we love Jesus? Here's my Bible right here. This is how we know we love Jesus. When we get saved, we take this word seriously. It's no longer a joke. It's no longer a game. We get grounded in this word. We pick it up every morning. My wife and I pray. We read the Bible. We're grounded in the word. We know what the word says. We know what we're supposed to be doing. We know what we're not supposed to be doing. We don't listen to the men and I'm not picking on Mormons if you come from a Mormon background but Joseph Smith wrote a Bible they lure you in with the Holy Bible then you have to put this Bible down and they give you the Joseph Smith Bible we can all write our own Bible to conform to our life the way we're living doesn't make it right we want to make sure we're reading the Holy Bible this yes. is the Bible we stand upon God took the hard part out he wrote the Bible for us it's really easy <clears throat> To follow this when we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we're wanting to please God. The problem is, when Dave keeps 5% back so Dave can do what Dave wants to do, that 5% is going to get me in trouble every time. Every time, brother. So if we're going to try good. to do our own thing, That's good. and we're going to push God off to the side and say, I got this, God, I don't need your help, He'll let us go. He'll let us stray off like those sheep. But yet, He will leave the 99 that are saved to go find that lost one. And the, what they used to do, and I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm beat up. Ask my wife. I got some injuries I never took care of. It's like, I got this finger, it doesn't straighten out. I got both my biceps are ripped now. I jumped from this slide down and I got a sore heel. And, I mean, I could go on and on and on about all the things. And, and uh, the shepherd would break the lamb's leg, the little sheep, so, so they couldn't walk away. And injuring him or her injuring the animal so they couldn't hobble away would actually help him in the long run. And then they put him over their back, carry him back. And uh, God does weird things to get our attention. You know, um, one of the things I didn't share with you in my testimony, God was trying to get my attention. So I was uh, not living inside my parents' home, but they would let me park my car in front of their house. And uh, they've been serving the Lord. My dad's been a Christian since he was 18. He's 84, and uh, he set a great example for me all my life. And it was Sunday, 
and uh, this was before I became homeless. They actually had let me come back into their house, but he said, no, you're using drugs in the house. Well, I used drugs in the house, and I was using them, but be it sneaky, and finally I just said, you know, I can't do this anymore. So I got caught, and he wanted me out of the house. He goes, you're using drugs in the house? I told you no drugs in the house. Get out. So I went to my car, and I had no toilet kit, no clothes. I'm in my Birkenstock shorts. He wanted me out of the house, so I walked out of the house, and then I had my car keys, and that was about all I had. So I walked back to the door, and he goes, go on. We're going to church. I'll deal with you later. And I go, I, I don't have any of my stuff. Give me my toilet kit and my clothes. I can't leave right now because... I have nothing. He goes, I don't want to deal with you right now. We're getting ready to go to church. And he was choir director of the same church for 42 years. And uh, they named the choir room the Perry City Choir Room in honor of my dad for all the years of service. So anyway, he didn't want to deal with me. Well, I wanted my stuff. I said, if you're kicking me out of the house, give me my stuff. You can't keep my stuff. He goes, we'll, do it. we'll deal with it after church. And I go, no, we'll deal with it now. He goes, no, we'll deal with it after church. So he wouldn't let me in, so I walked to my car. He opened the garage so they could leave. I walked back up to go through the garage. He shut the door. I walked back to my car, got in. He opened the garage door so they could leave. I walked back up, get in the house. He shut the garage door. This went on for about six or seven times. Finally, I go to my car. I started up. I drive over. I went up on one side, and I curved around like this, and I blocked both of their cars in. And he said, move your, cars or I'll call, move your car so we can get out, or I'm calling the cops. And I said, give me my stuff, and I'll leave. He goes, no, we'll deal with it later. So I said, we'll call the cops in. I'll wait till they get here and I'll explain my story. <laughs> well, guess what happens when you're on meth and the cops show up? You go to jail. <laughs> you go straight to jail. You don't pass go. You don't collect $200. You go straight to jail. And I was mad. I'm thinking, man, he's, he's not going to call the cops. But he did. And uh, I got in my car and my dad said, where are you going to go? And I said, I don't know, but I'm not staying here. See you later. And I didn't tell him where I was going. I didn't even know where I was going. I was just in my car and I was going. So I ended up at the Connections house. I parked there for about a week. And he says, you can't park there anymore, man. They were drug dealers because you're bringing heat around here. You got to leave. I went back. I tucked my tail between my legs, so to speak. I went back to my parents and I said, Dad, I can't park where I've been parking. I can park out at the parks, but you know how dangerous it is. It's getting to be a crazy world. And I, I gave him my gun so I wouldn't get in trouble. So he goes, I guess you can park in front of the house, but come here after the neighbors are sleeping and leave before they get up. I said, okay. So I did that for about a week. And then I got so tired, I just, I didn't even care. I pulled in before it got dark. I was still there at 10 in the morning. My mom would come over and knock on the window. Aren't you cold? you want a blanket? you want a pillow? Do you need something to eat? You know, you know how moms are. Your moms are <laughs> that loving, caring. And I'm sure it wasn't easy for my dad to do what he did either. I could have been in this position. It was my fault, but yet we want to blame others. So anyway, I'm homeless. I'm getting ready to go to court for the charges. And I had this gut feeling they're going to drop the charges. They did. I said, if they drop charges, I'm going to Teen Challenge. They dropped the charges. I came home. I, I applied for Teen Challenge, got in. So, so now that's kind of, you know, we already heard the rest of the story. So now, the point is, God gets our attention in ways that maybe we don't Amen. think. That's right. And it definitely got my attention. <laughs> and just the last time we were in Modesto, remember, my dad said I needed a swift kick in the rear end to get my attention. <laughs> and he had to be the bully to do that. But you know, it turned out good. Yeah. It was good results. So Christ has all of my heart now. Amen. I love him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. And it enables me to love my wife unconditionally. That love I have for Jesus. I share with her, and, and she does the same with me. It's, a, it's just, just a beautiful thing. So does Christ have your heart? Point two. Point three is, are you born again? I know that's a big word, born again. We can't crawl back up into our mother's womb, and she births us back out. And uh, to be born again just means... We sincerely ask Jesus into our hearts, our Lord and Savior. We meant it. We weren't teasing. And I got a funny story. I know I like telling stories. And I'll try to keep them short so we can get out here soon. But are we born again? So only Dave knows if he's born again. Yeah, my actions will kind of line up. If I'm saved, you're going to pretty much know. I turned from that old life. I asked Jesus into my heart, my Lord and Savior. I meant it. But there was a guy that was in Teen Challenge, and he uh, was making the craziest decisions. He's, we cleaned this 
place called JB Radiator, and they have computers, so they have that canned air. It's just air. He stole some from the set, from that place, and brings it back to the center, and they're underneath the house, where we met a few times with Jesse, but back further, there's a music room. You go through a door, you shut the door, and there's a little music room back there with a piano and a guitar, a couple guitars, drum set. And uh, there's four guys down there, and they're down there huffing this stuff. I guess you can get high on it. It's a dizzy. I don't know. Well, he brought it in, so he got in the most trouble. And he wanted to talk to me. He goes, Dave, can I talk to you? And I go, yeah. And, and, and I had already known that they got caught. He goes, you think I'm going to get kicked out of the house for this? And I go, well, I don't know if you'll get kicked completely out, but you're probably 100% sure you're going back to the crisis center to get a redo, to get a restart. And he goes, oh, man, is there anything I can do to stay here? And I go, well, let me ask you something. I just stopped it right there. I go, let me ask you something. And I, I, there were some other things he was doing that just weren't lining up with God's work. And they come in there because they're broke. They're not fixed. And so right. we, we're used to dealing with that. I said, point blank, I said, Joe, his name was Joe. I said, let me ask you something. Have you ever asked Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior? And he goes, this is a funny response. He goes, well, yeah, I, I did when I was younger, but I didn't mean it. <laughs> and I go like this. I go, well, don't you suppose God knew you really didn't mean it? And he goes, yeah, I guess he did. And I go, well, you ready to ask Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior and mean it? He goes, yeah. So right at my desk, we prayed. He asked Jesus into his heart as his Lord and Savior. He ended up going back to the crisis center, starting all over, ended up going to the Oakland Teen Challenge, excelled. Became an intern, now he's a staff member there. Oh, he took one decision to ask Jesus into his heart yes. as his Lord and Savior. So he's a new creation now. Amen. That means everything's new. We were doing whatever we were doing. Basically, God gives us a new life. We have a new life with Christ. We have a new lease on life, so to speak. We have a new attitude. Our brain thinks different. Our heart is different. He turns this heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And it's, you know, um, Romans 12, 2 says, um, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So, he became a new creation. So, are you born again? Amen. One, all are welcome. Two, does Christ have your heart? Three, are you born again? Four, is your old life behind you? Mm. So, if we're... Uh, if, if I'm still drinking and doing meth and uh, selling drugs and all that stuff, has my old life really gone? It says the old is gone. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. That old man has to be crucified. The old Dave has to stay buried six feet under. And he's always He's trying to resurrect himself. Yes. That old man is trying to resurrect himself. There's an old man called Petra. It's a real old Christian rock band. Yes. And they say, the song says, kill the old man. And it's got a cool rhythm. I think I even have that CD. <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit it, but yes, I got that old CD and it says, kill the old man. And it's talking about our, our old life. And what I do, my wife thinks is kind of funny. She likes it. I say, I got to go through the motions. I'm going to raise my hands up and surrender my life to the Lord. I just did it this morning. I said, Lord, Amen. I surrender my life Amen, to you brother. today. Amen. I'm here to be used by you. Use Amen. Me. Use to be used. Just like waving the white flag, I surrender. Yes. I'm giving up yes. my rights and my life for you, Lord. Use me in the ways you want me to be used. So the old man, he's gone. You can ask my wife. She doesn't even, she probably doesn't even believe I used to be that old guy. So these crazy <laughs> stories she hears, she's going, man, I never saw that. You know, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the old man is so far behind me and so far underground he's dead and he's remaining dead because it's daily Amen. I pick up my cross and I follow Jesus yes. I pick up my cross I pick up my double edged sword called the Bible yes. I don't do battles with guns, knives, swords and all that bazookas <laughs> and cannons I do my battles with prayer with reading God's word, knowing what it says. There's power. Remember the old saying, sticks and stones 
will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's nonsense. That is not true. We have the power. Proverbs 18, 21 says, There's, the power of life and death is in the tongue. The power of life and death is in the tongue. We can speak life into people and help them out, or we can speak death right into their lives and destroy their spirit permanently where they want nothing to do with Christianity. They want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. So we got to keep that old man crucified. Is your old life behind you? Mine is. And then number five. Well, let's go through them. One, all are welcome. Therefore, if anyone. Two, does Christ have your heart? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Three, are you born again? He is a new creation. You can put she is a new creation. When God talks about he, he's talking about mankind. Amen. He is a new creation. Is your old life behind you? The old has gone. And five, are you living a new life with Christ? And I started living this new life with Christ. And the funny thing is, when I got born again and I started living this new life with Christ, we have this joy that we, we have the fruit of the Spirit. Um, Galatians uh, chapter 5, it's like 19 through 23. So I think it's 22 and 23 to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when I look at people, because, you know, let's be honest, we want to see if people are really Christians, because I don't want to hang around with people that aren't Christians, and I can hang out with them for a few minutes or a little while, but like my son, I can't handle more than a half hour when he's wound up on meth, and he's bouncing off the walls, and we're trying to talk, and say conversations and everybody takes a turn and he's over there butting in and then he'll go sit on the couch and he's talking to himself and he's in a different world talking about aliens and, and there's good aliens. Uh, I'm not sure if aliens are bad or good, Dad. I think it was a good alien that came to visit me you know, and he was up on meth all night and, and he's out of his mind. And, and it, Number one is it disturbs me because I used to use meth with him. I don't want to be around that. Number two is it breaks my heart because I know there's a better life with Christ waiting for him. And Jesus is reaching down. He just has to say, okay, I'm done. But he's so stubborn. I don't know if he takes after me, but he doesn't want to change right now. There's nothing I can do about it. But pray. There's, I guess I shouldn't say there's nothing I can do about it. There's one key ingredient to that, and that is I can pray for him. My parents never gave up. And you know how many times they probably wanted to throw in the towel? They never did throw in the towel, but they probably got tired of praying for me. And saying, you know what? He's never going to change. Why are we wasting our time? But they kept praying. They kept praying. They kept praying. And now they're seeing the results of the fruit of their labors. And we can do that too. So I'm not going to give up. I'm going to just keep on praying. Amen. Are you living a new life with Christ? The new has come. So I'm at Riverside. Actually, I was at Shafter. And I got saved. And I knew there was a calling on my life that I'd been running from for about 10 or 15 years. I knew I was going to be preaching. I started preaching little sermonettes, five-minute sermons. And two other guys felt like they were going to be in the ministry too, so we were in a three-man rotation. One of us would preach and two would listen. Then another guy would get up and the other two would listen. Then another guy would get up and the other two would listen. We had special permission on Wednesday night to use the chapel in Shafter, California. Then when we got to Riverside, um, I started planning sermons, and nobody was listening. My son Joshua is not living in this new life with Christ because he's rejected Jesus. I'm going to keep praying for him. But if there's anybody in here that is not saved, we want to open up this uh, opportunity to get saved. And uh, I'll land this plane by saying the five points. Let's, let's quote the scripture. And the title is God Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. We want to walk in that newness with Christ. Our behavior has to be different. I tell people, you know what? Christianity isn't about do's and don'ts, but in actuality it is. We do what the Bible says. It, there, it, it's not tricky. He doesn't give us all this stuff we try, try to figure out on our own. He never, so far he hasn't asked me to climb up on the top of this church, jump off, flap my arms, see if I can fly like a bird. He doesn't do that kind of stuff. I wouldn't make that one. I wouldn't pass that test. 
gravitational flight. It's flat. And uh, so he doesn't, he might ask us to take, take a leap of faith, but he's not going to ask us to do, um, he, he intervenes to do the impossible. That's right. He didn't ask the disciples to raise Jesus from the dead. He did. He didn't ask the disciples to get the Virgin Mary pregnant. He did that through the Holy Spirit. So he'll do the impossible. We can do what's possible with us. And we'll let God intervene and do the impossible that only He can do. If we can do it, we don't need God. Amen. Right. The impossible comes from Him. And we don't have to understand everything. You know, I don't understand. Sometimes I wish I didn't have to go through all this stuff I went through. But on the other hand, I have a lot of silly experiences that I can share and, and hopefully keep somebody from going down that path. Amen. You know, Bart's got a lot of those experiences too that uh -huh. we wish we wouldn't have had to go through. You know? But yes, we did. Sir. For a reason. But now are you living with Christ? So, yes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is in a creation, the oldest God, the newest comes. All are welcome. So don't ever think God doesn't love the drunk in the gutter, wherever he is, God loves him just as much as he loves all of us. Yes. He created him. The person hooked on drugs like my son Josh, even though I don't want to be around him. God created him. God loves him. And I try to, you know, be around him. When I go to Modesto, he wants to come and stay with me. I said, no. When you got a year of clean and sober, you can come and visit. But right now, no. And hopefully that will encourage him to get clean and sober. <laughs> He'll have to choose what's more important. Visiting his dad or staying on drugs. I can't make that choice for him. All are welcome. Even the knuckleheads out there like I used to be. Amen. Does Christ have your heart? Are you born again? Is your old life behind you? And are you living a new life with Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you give us a new lease on life. The moment we ask Jesus into our heart, our heart is our Lord and Savior. Even if we've made bad decisions, sometimes we have to pay the consequences. But we do get to go to heaven. Just like the thief on the cross. He was getting ready to see death. And he said, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So thank you that we can be in paradise today. We don't want to wait till tomorrow. There's so many crazy drivers out there. I'm not saying we're going to get in a wreck on the way home, but there's so many accidents that happen and, and, and things happen unexpectedly. We want to be ready to meet our maker when our time on, uh, when our time on earth is up. And we just pray that uh, you would bless the rest of our service, bless the rest of our day, and bless the rest of our lives. We love you. We praise you. And we glorify your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say amen. Amen. All right, let's stand. If we can all stand together.